Hi, can everybody uh, can everybody hear me? You just give me a thumbs up. Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. We'll start in a few minutes. Okay, let's see. It looks like Ed Belding is on the line. Are you there, Ed? Uh, yes, I am, uh, Randy. Uh, I'm on the line. Uh, I'm physically ready and mentally ready. <laughs> okay, that's good. That's good. I guess we could um, we could start soon. Um, so uh, tonight. Here we have, thanks for everybody for coming out. Well, it's a couple minutes after. I guess they can join as they come in. Um, tonight we're talking about uh, South Brunswick's poets. It's called The Place and Time, South Brunswick Poets and Poetry Through the Years. And uh, joining us, we have Township Historian Ed Belding on the line. So um, Ed, whenever you're ready, you can, you can start. Okay, uh, thank you, Randy. Um, I wanna start with a quote from Mark Twain uh, he's not a South Brunswick Township uh, resident, uh, nor was he ever. Okay. Uh, but he has an interesting uh, approach uh, uh, in this uh, quote uh, that sort of ties two things together. Uh, Mark Twain said, history does not repeat itself, it rhymes. And one of the things that we want to try tonight uh, by, of course, studying local history, South Brunswick Township, uh, is to see over the years uh, how uh, the poets and poetry uh, have uh, contributed uh, to the local history uh, and uh, to history in general. Uh, and so it's a different look at uh, history uh, through the eyes and ears and minds of poets. So we'll see what we can come up with. Now, um, and Randy, this goes for you too. Um, I, uh, we had uh, some interest and some success last time with a little contest while we were doing this. So I thought up another contest for anybody who wants to participate. Uh, the prizes are unbelievable this time around, uh, uh, just to add a little excitement to it. Uh, but I thought you might want to try your hand at a little poetry while we're studying the poets, see what we can come up with. And I've called this local haiku. Okay. Now, you may or may not know about haiku, but it's uh, pretty basic, pretty easy to uh, uh, come up with something. Uh, using the uh, form for haiku. Uh, there are it, uh, uh, a regular haiku, uh, haiku or traditional uh, starts with a five syllable line. So if you're participating in the competition for this, whoever uh, gets the haiku first will, of course, be the winner. Give yourself five spaces on a piece of uh, scrap paper. Uh, for five one-syllable words. Okay. All right. The second line of the haiku contains seven syllables. Now, in that line of seven syllables, there will be five words, but two of the words are going to be two syllables each. Okay. Okay. And the last line goes back to five syllables. And there will be two words that are two syllables each. That's in the third line. So what you're looking at is first line you're looking for five words, 
And many of these words are in the poems which I'm going to be reading tonight, and I'll tell you uh, when we get to them. Uh, each word in that first line is going to be a one-syllable word. Now, I'm going to give you a bonus in the first line just to help you out. And that bonus is the word the, T-H-E. But I'm not going to tell you where in the line that goes. You have to figure that out. In the second line, there are three words that are one syllable and two words that are two syllable. And I'm going to give you a bonus in the second line, and that is the article A. One letter, A, but I'm not going to tell you where that is. Now we get to the third line. Two of the words are going to be two syllable each. That leaves you with one word that's one syllable. But I'm not going to give you any hints for the last line right now. Okay, everybody got that? Yep, ready. And I'll announce the uh, prizes at the end of the competition once we have a winner. Okay, I'm going to start, Randy, and you got your visuals ready for uh, Philip Morin Freneau? Yeah, yeah, he's ready to go. Okay. Um, so did so, you want me to read the, um, do you want me to read the, uh, the biography part? Or you... Yes, you need to read the biography. Okay. As soon as you're finished with the biography, then I will uh, read the poem. Okay. Philip Freneau is known as a poet of the American Revolution. As, a com at, as commitment exercises on graduating from Princeton's then College of New Jersey, it was considered part of Middlesex County South Ward in those days, he and a classmate composed and delivered a dialogue in blank verse on a rising glory of America in 1771. He was 19 at the time. Later, he came out strongly in favor of war and independence. And in some sat satires, he wrote against the British. After returning from the West Indies, Freneau continued to write in support of the American cause. In 1780, he was captured and spent seven weeks on board a prison ship in New York Harbor. He wrote about the experience and entitled his work, The British Prison Ships. He continued to write a series of anti-British poems throughout the rest of his life. After the war, Freneau became a friend and supporter of Thomas Jefferson. He was a newspaper editor in New York and Philadelphia and published, one, and published for one year in the New Jersey Chronicle. He was also involved in the commerce of the West, in the West Indies and India. Freneau was the son of Pierre Freneau and grandson of Andre Freneau, a Huguenot who came to America in 1707. He was born in New York City in 1752 and lived in Monmouth County most of his life. He married Eleanor Foreman. He had four daughters. Freneau died tragically on December 18, 1832, when he lost his way while crossing a swamp during a blinding snowstorm and froze to death. His best poems are The Wild Honeysuckle and The Indian Burying Ground. Okay, uh, I am going to read uh, Freneau's poem, To a Honeybee. Thou born to sip the lake or spring, or quaff the waters of the stream, why hither come on vagrant wing? Does Bacchus tempting seem? Did he for you the glass prepare? Will I admit you to a share? Did storms harass or foes perplex? Did wasps or kingbirds bring dismay? Did wars distress or labors vex? Or did you miss your way? A better seat you could not take than on the margin of this lake. Welcome, I hail you to my glass. All welcome here you find. Here let the cloud of trouble pass. Here be all care resigned. This fluid never fails to please and drown the griefs 
of men or bees. What forced you here we cannot know, and you will scarcely tell. But cheery we would have you go and bid a glad farewell. On lighter wings we bid you fly. Your dart will now all foes defy. Yet take not, O, oh, to deep a drink, and in the ocean die. Here bigger bees than you might sink, even bees full six feet high. Like Pharaoh, then, you would be said to perish in a sea of red. Do as you please, your will is mine. Enjoy it without fear, and your grave will be this glass of wine your epitaph a tear. Go take your seat in Sharon's boat. We'll tell the hive you died afloat. Does anybody know uh, what Freneau is referring to when he, uh, this is an ode, by the way, to the honeybee. When he refers to the honeybee, do you think you know what he actually was referring to? Hmm. No, there must I don't, be a I lot don't, of thinking going on. <laughs> I don't. I don't have. I can't even hazard a guess. Can, can somebody else? <laughs> <laughs> does anybody else have an idea? Who who is the honeybee? Well, that's the question, right? <laughs> Randy, it has something to do with uh, what you read in the biography of uh, Freneau. So it has to do. Well, he's talking a lot about um, our, the, the fight for freedom, right? For so, does it have something to do with? All right, I'm going to guess here. Does that have anything to do with our freedom from, from the British? Uh, yeah, well, the, the key word is the British. Okay. Uh, the honeybee is the British soldier. Okay. And uh, there's a lot of this uh, back and forth, back and forth, like go back where you uh, came from, you know, that type of thing. Uh, but the poem is reflective of the 18th century uh, type of poetry, uh, and, uh, you know, as uh, uh, Mark Twain said, uh, history rhymes. Well, this is your comfortable, traditional uh, rhyming that you had in poetry uh, back in the good old days. And I think, if anything, uh, from the uh, ten poets and uh, the, uh, the young poet that we have at the end, uh, you have uh, uh, the evolution of poetry. And, uh, uh, of course, we're, we're emphasizing the local flavor here. Okay. Um, I want to give you uh, one of the clues uh, for the haiku. And um, this is a word uh, that goes in the first line. I'm not going to tell you where, uh, but it was from the honeybee, uh, adding an S to it. Uh, this is the word graves. What's what's the word, Ed? G R A V E S. Graves. That's one of the words that goes in the first line of the haiku that we're building here. So so far in the first slide, you should have the, and you should have the word graves. Okay. 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 We're ready for the second uh, bio. The second bio, okay. The second biography. The second biography we have is Robert Pinsky. Um, and Ed, you can't see what's on the screen here, but we have a, a picture of Robert Pinsky. And um, actually there's the sculpture over at Princeton University that George Siegel has done. And there's also a cartoon uh, rendering of Pinsky because he was on The Simpsons. So that's what I have showing on the screen. And right. uh, yeah, the, the name of his poem is Genesis According to George Siegel. But Robert Pinsky 
the New Jersey poet who wrote Genesis according to George Siegel served as US poet laureate in consulate in poetry to the Library of Congress from 1997 to 2000. He's the author of 19 books, mostly collections of his poems. His best effort is probably Selected Poems, um, 2011. And he is known for transitions of, translations of Dante's Inferno and the separate notebooks by Czesław Miłosz, who was a Polish poet. Pinsky was born in 1940 in Long Branch, New Jersey to Milford Simon Pinsky and Sylvia Eisenberg. He earned a BA from Rutgers and an MA and PhD from Stanford. He married Ellen Jane Bailey in 1961, and they had three children. Pinsky taught at Wellesley College at the University of California and presently teaches at Boston University. As a former saxophonist, Pinsky's work is strongly influenced by jazz. He is known for the musicality of his work. It can be described as lines manifesting rhythm without rules. Just as George Siegel stands as one of the best artists to hail from New Jersey, Sir Robert Pinsky stands as one of the state's best poets. Okay. Okay, I'll be reading uh, Genesis according to George Siegel. The spirit brooded on the water and made the earth and molded us out of earth. And then the spirit breathed itself into our nostrils and rested. What was the spirit waiting for? An image of its nature, a looking glass? Glass also made of dust, of sand and fire. Ordinary, enigmatic, we people waiting in the terminal, a survivor at a wire fence also waiting. Behind him a tangle of bodies made out of plaster, which plasterers call mud. The apprentice hurries with a hod of mud, particulate sand for glass, milled flour for bread. What are we waiting for? The hourglass that measures all our time in trickling dust is also of dust and will return to dust. So an old poem says, men in a bread line out in the dusty street are silent waiting at the apportioning place of daily bread. At an old fashioned radio's wooden case, a man sits listening in a wooden chair. A woman at a butcher block waits to cut. What are we waiting for in clouds of dust? Or waiting for the past, particles of being, settled and moist with life, then brittle again. I think a question, Randy, uh, that uh, this Poem begs to uh, get an answer for is the people that Pinsky is writing about, most of them or many of them came from what township, lived in what township? For this poem? For, yeah. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Ed. <laughs> well, think. Give me a hint. <laughs> he's he's writing uh, he's writing about Genesis according to George Siegel, and okay. he makes a lot of uh, allusions to uh, George Siegel's works, like the one in the library, you know, in the lobby, and okay. uh, several others. Uh, but the question I'm asking is, uh, and how this relates to our township. George Siegel's subjects that he put yeah. the plaster on that, uh, that ended up being the sculpted pieces. Who were those people in that mud and uh, sand and whatever? They were residents of South Brunswick a lot of the time. Excellent. They were residents of South <laughs> Brunswick. Yeah. Neighbors uh, like Dave Cutleroff. And right, right. Uh, 
Leon Bibble. And uh, you can go up and down the list there. But uh, uh, this this is an excellent poem, and it uh, zeroes right in, uh, gets to the, the heart of what we're talking about, that South Brunswick is a participant in this type of history. So some okay. of our residents were immortalized in the plaster. <laughs> So what you're saying is, uh, yeah, Siegel kind of immortalized them in, in the plaster, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, for the haiku, we need another word. And since we're talking about Genesis and all that, we're going to go to the second line. And I'm giving you the word moon. M-O-O-N. Moon. Okay. So in the second line, which contains seven syllables altogether, so far you have the article A and you have the word moon. Okay, Randy, we're ready for the third bio. Okay. Oops. Okay, Don Fagan. Donald J. Fagan is a recording artist best known as co-founder, lead singer, songwriter, and keyboardist for Steely Dan. In 2001, he was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Fagan was born in Passaic, New Jersey in 1948 to Jerry Fagan and his wife, Eleanor. The Fagans moved to Kendall Park in 1959. Donald hated suburban life, but his impact inspired the lyrics to his songs in the album, The Nightfly released in 1982 and nominated for a Grammy the next year. In the 1950s, Fagan was inspired by rock and roll and rhythm and blues music. After attending the Newport Jazz Festival in 1959, he, be he became interested in playing jazz. He learned piano and played a horn in the South Brunswick High School marching band until he graduated in 1965. He attended Baird College where he met Walter Brecker, Becker, who became his partner in Steely Dan until he died in 2017. In 1993, Fagan married Libby Titus, a fellow Bard student. The marriage had its ups and downs, but the two are still together. Don Fagan considered himself a, a self-taught musician and vocalist. Early in his career, he suffered from severe stage fright, so much that other artists had a cover for him. His lyrics do reflect a certain degree of angst and quiet desperation about fitting in. Throughout the poetic lines of his lyrics, one can feel the influence of early rock and jazz. The, select, the selection for tonight are the lyrics to the follow-up single, New Frontier, which is released after the top 40 hit, I-G-Y. Okay, New Frontier. I'm going to do uh, three stanzas uh, from this uh, uh, lyric. Yes, we're going to have a wing ding, a summer smoker underground. It's just a dugout that my dad built in case the Reds decide to push the button down. We've got provisions and lots of beer. The key word is survival on the new frontier. Introduce me to that big blonde. She's got a touch of Tuesday Weld. She's wearing ambush and a French twist. She's got us wild and she can tell. She loves to limbo. That much is clear. She's got the right dynamic for the new frontier. Do you have a steady boyfriend? Because, honey, I've been watching you. I hear you're mad about Brubeck. I like your eyes. I like him too. He's an artist, a pioneer. We've got to have some music on the new frontier. One of the things that uh, is great about this one is uh, we have a rhyme scheme in there uh, in a uh, jazz based type of uh, lyric. And I like that combination, you know, as we go from uh, Freneau to Pinsky to Fagan. Uh, that's an interesting triad. 
Uh, and uh, I've always maintained that a good poem is worth reading more than once. And we don't have the time to do that, but I invite you to uh, Google Don uh, Fagan's uh, lyrics of his uh songs and you can see uh, the poetic side of, of his work. Uh, do you, uh, ha do you, did you hear any references uh, to uh, South Brunswick in there? Any details that uh, sort of take you back to the 19, late 1950s, 1960s? Well, he's talking about uh... The, the dugout that his his father built in case the reds the reds press the button so I guess that's the that's the fallout shelter right that was in his in his backyard yeah that's that's interesting yeah he uh, he lived in Kendall Park and the father built uh, a uh, a bomb shelter in the uh, backyard uh, one of the great things about the Kendall Park homes when they were built was the large uh, 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 plots that the houses were built on. So there was plenty of room to do this type of thing. Uh, of course, the problem was there's lots of shale uh, under the uh, the top soil in Kendall Park. So that, that might have been a challenge to build it. I don't know how deep he went down, but it's an interesting uh, uh, anecdote there that, that sort of puts this uh, a place in time. Uh, as soon as he mentions the dugout that my dad built, uh, I, I think that that's a very interesting line. And then he's got, he mentions Tuesday Weld, wearing ambush, and that, that sort of thing. So in other words, those are all uh, little cultural details that that put this in a certain time period of our history. Okay, and you need a clue for the third line of the haiku. And I'm going to give you the word raising. This is in the third line, two syllables, raising. And that's spelled R-A-I-S-I-N-G. Raising. Okay, Randy, we're ready for the fourth bio. Okay. The next one we have is Joyce Greenberg Lott. She was born in 1938 in Atlantic City, New Jersey. She earned her BA degree at Douglas College in 1976 and a Master of Arts degree at Rutgers in 1979. She was an English teacher at South Brunswick High School for 25 years. She founded a creative writing, pro writing program there. She also wrote a book, A Teacher's Stories, in 1994 about her experiences there. Um, Joyce Lott's um, chapbooks of poems are Dear Mrs. Dalloway, An Unexpected Life, and her anthology of, of contrib contributions are in Cool Women, um, Volume 1, Year 2000, Cool Women, Volume 2, 2002, Proposing on the Brooklyn Bridge, 2003, in Cool Women, Volume 3, 2005. She has also contributed to the following journals, English Journal, Journal of New Jersey Poets, Calliope, Ms. Patterson Literary Review, The Writer's Chronicle, US One Newspaper, and Writing of Our Lives. She is a recipient of the New Jersey Poetry Monthly Prize and the Allen Ginsberg Prize. The poets who inspired Mrs. Lott the most were Anne Sexton, Sylvia Plath, Marie Howe and Mary Oliver. From them, she found comfort and ease in expressing herself in poetic form. Her goals has always been to provide herself, to find herself through imagery, feeling, and poetic structure. Her poems tend to be personal and all are worth sharing. Also, um, she also wrote Dear Joe 2018, a series of letters to her husband who died a few months before his 92nd birthday. She published these letters as a celebration and continuance of life. And I have a quote from her. Um, she says, we live in a society, we live in a society that fears death. Those of us familiar with death need to speak out about our experiences. So that's uh, the bio on Joyce Greenberg lot. 
Okay, the poem that uh, we've selected uh, for Joyce is On Winter Days. When the snow plow's not been out and old oaks draped in white know everyone shoveling their driveway, I wonder where birds hide. Red-headed woodpecker, chickadees who fluttered at feeders in darkening sky. We hide, too, my husband and I, behind spices and soups, apples saucing on stove, forgetting tasks we spent days accomplishing, checkbook tallies and grocery lists, lesson plans to improve others' lives. For now, I contemplate white blankets laid to rest on roof. Suppose that the sun will never come out. That gray-white light is all I'll ever see. At 90, mother's almost blind. So brave, I think, or foolish, all of us who never give up, who spend such energy changing the landscape of things. Why not accept this neighborhood covered in snow? Wait like birds, precarious in winter oaks. Joyce Lots on Winter Days. I'm imagining that uh, Joyce uh, wrote this uh, while she was in Kendall, uh, well, not Kendall Park, but in South Brunswick. And uh, so this is a winter scene. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not definite on this, but this is a winter scene uh, that has to do with uh, winter in South Brunswick. Um, and her lines are, are, are really worth uh, pouring over. And uh, so, Randy, the, the sources that you mentioned, uh, those are ones that I would recommend for our listeners to try to get a hold of if they can. Um, okay, and uh, we need another word. So this is back to the first line. And the word is drapes, D-R-A-P-E-S. Drapes. I'm dropping the D in her word and adding an S. So the word is drapes in the first line of the haiku. So, so far in the first line, you have the graves and drapes. And Randy, we re we're ready for number five. Okay. Okay, number five is our own Ed Belling. Ed Belling was born in North Adams, Massachusetts in 1942. He came to New Jersey in the 19, early 1950s and graduated from Ridgewood High School in 1960. He majored in history at Rutgers University and graduated from there in 1965. He was an educator administrator in private and public schools in New Brunswick for close to 45 years. Along the way, he won a Rutgers Distinguished Scholars Award in 1990, which allowed him to earn a master's degree in education. He did some adjunct teaching at Middlesex County College and Rutgers. Ed and his wife Florence have lived in Kendall Park since 1976. They raised two children and have eight grandchildren. Ed started writing poetry in high school and has never stopped. His two published works, Stryker's Gambit and The Broken Bridge, are historical accounts of the Revolutionary War in poetic form. His self-published works include a score of chapbooks and two Weatherall mysteries in prose form, Iron Water and The Placeman. He is currently working on a third mystery, 13 Stripes, and doing research on the early history of South Brunswick. Three years ago, Ed was appointed the South, to be the South Brunswick Township Historian. Okay, um, this poem is entitled Council on Horseback. It takes place at the top of the hill in Kingston. Uh, you know it as Route 27. Uh, back then it was called the King's Highway. A uh, thing to look out for uh, when I read this uh, poem, uh, which uh, is, is what I consider a turning point in the American Revolution. Uh, 
great decision has to be made, whether to continue fighting uh, or to take a breather. And uh, that's what the Council on Horseback is all about. George Washington had a technique uh, which he used. Uh, he basically made up his mind a lot, but then he always allowed his generals to uh, give their two cents worth. And one of the things you can look for in this poem is uh, what I call it democratic verse. In other words, each time there's a new person, I change the style. Uh, so uh, there's a lot of uh, well-known, famous people from the American Revolution in the poem. So without further ado, here we go. Council on horseback. What is my password, George Washington asked, and what does it mean to you? The generals addressed responded as one, victory or death. Then they took turns explaining the aim of their way. The leaders had drawn their horses together at the crown of Kingstown Hill for a council on matters of fate, of incomplete plans and options left in circumstance. Nat Green spoke first, as his deputy rank would allow. Two victories we've gained with very few dead. Praise be to God, and I'd like to keep it that way. I'd like to trust in the staymaker's words, a fire worth a brigade. But we need more than words, a fresh few hundred well-rested and fed. Where's the magic to find them? God only knows ghosts and angels to summon, but the British won't wait for a prayer. Our men are fatigued, using their legs since Trenton's parade, denied their sleep and a meal in more than a day. I say we seek out the hills where rest is a mile away, and food is bountiful fare. Let's trust where the Lord's hand leads. Arthur St. Clair, the youngest there, dared speak next. I speak for Mercer. I know what he wants. Take both college towns, for the best prize remains. We skirmish for minutes this fine frosty morn, and we turn to fearless, so hope still aflame. Take a chance with a thousand while the red coats are split. There's no red in the sky. It's all blue to Brunswick today. Chief of Artillery, the stern Colonel Knox, cut in. We don't walk on the sky, my green brigadier. The road on ahead is rough and it's rude, with boulders and stumps all the way up. A devilish path for my cannon carts, too. I calculate a hundred-foot climb to the top by men cold and hungry, hurt and worn down, and me with more field pieces than most in fear that we'll slow the rest. Why don't we follow the Millstown Creek and push to the wide land where rivers meet? Then the thousand most eager to stay on their feet can rush with their luck to seize a Lord's base. Dower John Sullivan belched loudly, then took a turn. Lee is kept where we wish to go plus the bountiful stores and a magazine begging for fire. But we dawdled in Princetown, and here, two hours of nothing, not even a good warm beer. And these men are far beyond tired, even though spirits are high. More spirits are needed right here. I like an ambush right on this road, a top ten-mile mount would spell ruin for Redcoat and Kraut. Or tracing the river sounds fair to me. On down to the landing, it depends on our courage and speed. Whatever you choose is mine to allow, whether Dark Chance or Morristown makes no difference to me. Joseph Reed had chafed long enough to weigh in with his views. All this chatter of battles won, lost or drawn, and plans for one more singular prize Easy to say when rested and full, but we're neither. It's warm meal and nap, not Brunswick men crave. 
Torn and tattered by fighting, these men have become, and worn out through vigil and walk, too few to fight or ready to stand. Miles, we're asking, in our haste to attack, to find our own graves. In a decade of days, we've turned upside down the dance of King's men on New Jersey land. His piper's been paid at Princetown and Trent left us on top with all lobsters muddled and middens they heap. Why spoil our luck with a hasty mad dash, hell-bent for leather with not enough shoes? It's time to leave this hamlet behind. Turn to the left. Head where safe hills are found. Leave Brunswick alone. Cadwallader readied a few words he wanted to give. There's good reason to follow the road to the left. A prize of consolation awaits if we go, for rumors abound of a baggage train of great worth with a thousand or more redcoats near the courthouse. Tom Mifflin, snug in his blanket coat, was last with a view. To the right and then back around, we start on the South River Road. The land's flat and it's broad and it hides what we hold down to Burlington. After a measure of general words, George Washington spoke. Victory or death, victory or death, that is all we ask of ourselves. And it is plain to see we have won this day, but the cost, but the cost, the dear men we lost. It is more that await us in Brunswick town, whether now or some other day. With half the fresh troops you request, my knight, we ruin their quarters, claim their stores, and take Matthew's garrison down. But we can't, no, we can't, for grand men need rest. We must turn with regret to secret our gain before the skies trouble the way. We will win this war in the long days ahead, with caution as clear as our courage, and the password still to be used when we turn when we turn, victory or death, victory or death. Okay. Um, Randy, did, did anybody have any questions on that? Uh, no, nothing came across it, I see. But if anyone does, they can unmute and, uh, and ask. That'd be fine. Okay, while we're waiting, because uh, that's an awful lot, and uh, I'll mention a couple of things about it, uh, you know, as, as far as it, it, it relates to South Brunswick, and, uh, you know, I said that uh, this can be considered a turning point. Now, it's early in the war, but the key to this is that this signifies that the war is not going to be a short war. This is going to be a long war. And this decision happened right on the border between Somerset County and Middlesex County, right in Kingston. Uh, I believe that I'm the first one to write about it uh, in, in any length. And that, of course, always uh, irks me that uh, people seem to overlook it. They put the emphasis on the two battles of Trenton and the Battle of Princeton, and they don't put uh, any emphasis on, on this turning point um, and that the, the uh, possible defeat of the American forces trying to take New Brunswick never occurred. And we're fortunate in a way that it didn't. Okay, now with the haiku, uh, there is a word uh, in the second line. Uh, the word is speechless. S-P-E-E-C-H-L-E-S-S. -S -S. Two-syllable word in the second line.
And we're ready for the next file. Okay. The next one is Chris Breitfeld. Um, former Kendall Park resident, Chris Breitfeld was born in 1955 to Jim and Maria Breitfeld. They were one of the first families to purchase a home in Kendall Park. Chris attended South Brunswick Public Schools and was involved in musical activities since his Cambridge school days. Breitfeld now resides in West Orange, New Jersey and is still is involved in making music. He was a leading force behind the power pop band, The Breedles, in the 1980s and 90s. He got together a group of locals at 13 Jolene Road and called themselves the Statics. Donald Fagan of Steely Dan fame lived just down the street. The Breedles started around 1985 and developed what has become in the music industry known as the Kendall Park Sound. Their song style is reminiscent of The Who, The Beatles, The Birds, all rolled into one. The band's album, albums include Squares in Paris, 1986, Arkansas Traveler, 87, Breedles 3, 88, and Pop Go the Breedles, 1995, and Spooge, 1996, um, and Ego, The Story of the Shores. Breitfeld continues to perform, produce, and engineer his albums, which have included a variety of musicians over the recent years. Okay, uh, the poem is entitled, My Sense of Wonder, uh, lyrics to a, a song, of course. And uh, it might be, uh, uh, um, it might behoove you to uh, compare this to Fagan's, of course, uh, his his uh, uh, sample, and also the evolution here as, as we uh, get into a stream of conscious type of uh, 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 writing. My sense of wonder. My sense of wonder playing all the records in my house. My strength from under. Bob Dylan wasn't bad. Maybe Donovan needed some restraint from mantra-driven oracles, and Tommy was so sad, so sad. His buddy Arthur and the symphony to God, never known as a non-believer, while Mooney tossed the coffee table. My sense of wonder, living all the records in my house, still feel the thunder. You really should have been there, February 9, 1964, all my loving changed the freaking world. All the chords were learned, A, E, D, G, harmonizing at the Cambridge School and more, while someone pressed the record button. Meeting John after Sweeney Todd, oh yeah, imagine what he would say in the lobby after Sunday's show. Us from second balcony, John in the 10th row. Three smiling angels, Dr. O'Boogie ought to know, they're smiling for Sweeney. Dedicated young men, two guitars and a green amp, Muswell Hill. Then the old man rolled a hairy rag. Count the gigs you play, one, two, three, four, five. Turning up for a Tuesday set is hard, when no one's there except the little bar flies. My sense of wonder, thoughts and words in print magnetic tape, now done with numbers. My sense of wonder, monkey's pictures, 16 magazine. Hey, hung up old Mr. Normal. All the records cried out. My sense of wonder, psychedelic yogi, XYC. Oh, Johnny Thunder. All the records cried out. It's my favorite game. Don't stop. Okay, um, I have a word. From there, let's see what is, ah, the word is under. It's in the second line of the haiku, U-N-D-E-R, under. Everybody got that? Yep. Okay. Uh, 
Uh, did anybody catch the uh, uh, references in there? Uh, local South Brunswick uh, Kendall Park references. He talked about Cambridge, right? Right, Cambridge School. Right, right. I heard him say that. I don't know if there were there if there are any others in there. I didn't. I don't know. Okay, there probably were, but that that is the key one. Yeah. Uh, what he uh, a lot of what he's talking about would be, you know, again, this is a time and place thing. Uh, you know, in the '60s, uh, possibly early '70s, when you're, uh, you know, he mentioned 1964 with the the Beatles coming, uh, the, the you know, the English invasion and uh, the music then, and he it makes a lot of references to singers, uh, Donovan and uh, I think Johnny Rivers or Johnny Thunder and uh, 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 some some other uh, names. Uh, some are uh, obscure. Some of them are, are ones that, uh, uh, you know, like their household names. Uh, he, he mentions, uh, I think he makes, he mentions uh, Moon. I guess he's talking about Keith Moon. From yeah, 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 uh, yeah. And Bob Dylan, he mentions. Uh, uh, so he covers a lot of bases here. Okay, Randy, we're ready for the next one. Okay. Okay, Hayes Davis. Hayes Davis was born in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. He attended South Brunswick High School in the 90s and moved to the Washington, D.C. area to attend the University of Maryland in 1998. Hayes earned a master's degree in fine arts from this university and won the Academy of American Poets Prize while there. He was a founding member of Cave Canem's first cohort of fellows and former Breadloaf working scholar um, and former Geraldine Miles poet scholar at the Squaw Valley Community of Writers. He currently teaches at the Sidwell Friends School in Washington, D.C. Hayes lives in Silver Spring, Silver Spring, Maryland with his wife and poet, Terry Ellen Cross Davis, and two children. His first volume of poems is entitled, is entitled Let Our Eyes Linger, published by the Poetry Mutual Press in 2016. His work has appeared in various anthologies, the New England Review, Poet Lore, Gargoyle, Delaware Poetry Review, and Kinfolks. Okay, and I'll be reading his poem, Groove. Their feet own a pattern on the dance floor. Years of love have practiced this improvisation. Their ears know the inside walls of the bass, and their legs are possessed by the speakers. Years of love have practiced this improvisation that makes jealous couples head for the door. Their legs are possessed by the speakers. Share space that fits in warm grooves of vinyl. Jealous couples who don't head for the door Marvel at movement of pelvis to legs to funk. Sharing space that fits in warm grooves of vinyl. The dancers don't feel anything but the hip shake. Marvelous movement of pelvis to legs to funk. Shows their ears know the inside walls of the base. The dancer don't feel anything but the hip shake. Their feet own a pattern on the dance floor. Hayes Davis, Groove. Did anybody uh, pick up on a uh, rhythm uh, generated uh, by this poem? and pick up on the technique to develop that. Did anybody catch that? I, I know, it felt, I felt there was a groove, but I don't know the technique though. What, what was the technique? Uh, a repetition of words and, and, and uh, uh, a cluster of words. You know, in other words, as you go through it uh, uh, you, and you, you start to count the number of times he repeats, uh, you know, as you would with a rhythm, Right. You know, to develop a rhythm, 
Uh, and so uh, his coupling of some words and then repeating them and then repeating them again, you know, and then you get that you get a rhythm uh, type effect from it. Uh, uh, I thought it was pretty good in that respect. Yeah, it definitely had a rhythm. Yeah, oh yeah. Now we have a word for our haiku. Uh, I'm going to give you the word busy. Just as the dancers were busy in this uh, poem I just read. This is in the third line. B-U-S-Y. Busy. Okay, and we're ready for the next one, Randy. Okay. Okay, Jean E. Dwarak. Jean Dwarak is the author, author of several books that all have something to do with horses. She has owned and worked with horses almost all of her life. She has competed at the FEI level in the hunter jumper category in, and in dresses. Her favorite horses, such in, in, I'm sorry, her favorite horse in such competition was named Russell R. Besides writing about horses and riding them, Jean served as an English teacher for 38 years. She has also been involved in singing and composing and as well as being a community activist. Her published writings include The Loving Cup, White Wind, Silver and Shards, The Wall Between, For Christmas, Honor's Way, and Kingdom Beyond the Rim. The selection for night's theme is entitled Passing Fancies, which is printed in the Central Post on July 10th, 1980. Okay, uh, passing fancies. The thing to look for here would be the rhyme scheme because we're talking about 1980, uh, but, and we've had a lot of, uh, uh, we've had s several choices where there wasn't really much of a rhyme going on or no rhyme at all. Uh, but this has a rhyme and the, the thing I like about it is it gets right to the point. Passing fancies. In the dreams of a child, the horses dance with manes and tails that fly. They whirl and snort on golden hoofs that gallop through the sky. Then wisdom catches Pegasus as age makes those dreams few. Children outgrow fantasies while horsemen never do. A short poem, but there's uh, quite quite a powerful uh, a thing going on, a dynamic going on there, and uh, uh, we're we're involved in it. It's all about aging, and some people uh, hold on to their dreams and hopes and so forth better than some other people do. Uh, let me see if I have a word for this. Um, no, I don't. Uh, but I did forget one uh, for counsel on horseback, Randy. I got to apologize for that. Uh, the word is ghosts in the third line. G-H-O-S-T-S, -S, ghosts. Okay. All right. Now, I've given you all the words for the third line. Huh. But what you have to do is figure out the order of those three words. And what's left is there are three. There are three words left that we need to do, and we've got all the uh, words, all the syllables for the haiku for to find a winner. Now, anybody can uh, uh, read, read what they have if they have sort of guessed it early. I, I doubt it, but uh, that might happen. Okay, we're ready for uh, number nine. Okay. Hank Callett. Hank Callett is a longtime journalist and poet 
who has concentrated on social issues of regional, national, and international import for the past 30 years. He was a longtime editor and writer from the, for the Princeton Packet. He also conducted formal poetry readings on a monthly basis at the South Brunswick Library for several years. Hank received his master's in fine arts, majoring in creative writing from Fairleigh Dickinson University in 2013. He has written several chapbooks, including Suburban Pastoral, 2008, Certainties and Uncertainties, 2010, and Stealing Copper, 2015. His poems have appeared in several anthologies and national publications. Hank teaches journalism and writing at Rutgers University and Middlesex County Community College. He lives in South Brunswick with his wife, Annie. Okay, uh, I had many of Hank's poems to choose from. Uh, a lot of his poems uh, are uh, uh, a social awareness driven uh, uh, type of writing. And they uh, expand out uh, and, and a lot of times don't really have anything to do uh, directly with, with uh, South Brunswick. Uh, but the one that I picked, there is something uh, is sort of like uh, 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 Joyce's poem that I read before, uh, where you hope and you think that it was written and inspired by what was going on in South Brunswick at the time it was written. Uh, so there is something by Hank Callett. Here we go. In the house, more than winter's quiet, heart beating, fitful, tentative, a breath on the bedroom window, furnace flickering to heat, more like last steps than the first, more like indifference than the easy silence that accompanies knowing. And I wonder, sun still in the distance, and morning stalled in its formation. What has given way beneath us? Okay, this is a uh, poem that makes you think, uh, but I like the uh, the details, uh, and uh, I can feel this taking place in South Brunswick. I don't know how you feel. Randy, how do you feel? Well, so what, what are the themes that he's, that he's talking about? What are the major themes? Well, yeah. you, gotta, you, have this, you have the seasonal thing, okay? And um, a lot of uh, good poems go from the, the small detail to the universal. So by the time you get to the end of the poem, uh, a poet is very good at asking the universal questions. A poet is not very good at giving the answers. So that sort of lends itself to the poet is trying to get you to think, trying to get you to expand. And this poem does a very good job of that. You know, so you start with a house, you start with winter, you start with a bedroom window, furnace flickering, you know, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And then you get to the end. And I wonder, the poet is wondering for all of us, sun still in the distance, the morning stalled in its formation. What has given way beneath us? So it sounds, not, I don't know about ominous, but it sounds like, you know, there's something that's, something that's missing and something that's, that's not, not right. You know, it's given way. So. Okay. Yeah. yeah there's the question there. And, and Hank always leaves you with the feeling of there's something important going on here. There's something very significant, something very important. And uh, as I say, poets don't have all the answers, uh, but they sure have a lot of questions. <laughs> okay, we're, uh, let me see, do I have another word here? Oh, yes, I do. Uh, since this is winter, uh, we go to the first line, 
snow, S-N-O-W. Okay, that leaves us with only two words to go. And then you have all the words to the haiku we're looking for. Okay, Randy, you ready with Tom Riach? Yep. So now we have Tom Riach. Tom Riach is a Trenton-based singer, songwriter, arranger, producer, and engineer. He grew up in Kendall Park and went through the South Brunswick school system. From there, he got into music and got into the music business early. He fronted the jazz, rock, funk band Down the Earth for many years. These last few years, he has played keyboard and vocals with other artists. His CDs include Mainstay, um, 1994, Lost Hippie, and 2000. Tom has also released two instrumental New Age CDs of late. His latest CD, Roll On, includes some of his old material. Riach is the owner operator of Squirrel Ranch Recording Studio in Hamilton, New Jersey. And I, up here I have a picture of him and then he also contributed to this album. Uh, it's called Go Go Phillies. Uh, it's cool specs. This is a, a nationally released album that, that he played on. So the graphic I have up here Ed, is a, the picture of that album that he plays on. Great, good. Okay, this poem uh, by Tom Riak is Children's Lullaby. And I, I wanted to end the 10 that we selected uh, with something uh, that, that sort of uh, wraps it up in a, in a very uh, simple, humble way. Uh, and also it's interesting that we now turn back to a very tight rhyme scheme. Uh, sort of like when we started with Freneau. Uh, so in modern times, uh, those of you who are into writing poetry and so forth, uh, no need to shy away from uh, rhyme uh, to show how brave you are. Uh, it doesn't just have to be uh, free verse and uh, um, rap uh, type stuff. Of course, uh, the rap stuff has uh, uh, tight rhymes too. Uh, but this is children's lullaby. Good night, my angel, good night. Sleep tight, my angel, sleep tight. You've had yourself a busy, busy day. Time to put your playthings away. It's time to lie down to sleep. No need for angels to weep. You have close by a loving dad and mom who will always keep you cozy and warm. Sail on off to dreamland on a river of love. Soar through the starlight that shines from above. Legions of angels will show you the way till you wake to your next perfect day. My sweet, you bring us such joy. This world will soon be your toy. So soon you'll be a gorgeous bright light. So good night, my angel, good night. Good night, my angel, good night. And I have to give you the last two words for the haiku. In the second line, the word is pearl, P-E-A-R-L, pearl. And in the first line, a surname uh, that goes way back in the history of South Brunswick that rhymes with green. And that surname makes this a local haiku. That's in the first line. And, and what's the word? You're looking for a word that rhymes with green, the color green. 
And the clue is, it's a surname that goes way back in the history of South Brunswick. Rhymes with green. And I'll give you another clue. Uh, there are a couple of street signs in town that carry this name, but they added an S to it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh. What, what could it be? <laughs> Even I got that one, all right. <laughs> I, I think I have it, I think I have it. <laughs> okay, we'll give that uh, name for the second clue. It's called the Randy clue. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so you have all the words to the haiku, but I, uh, I'll talk about this later. Is uh, your young lady ready for her poem? Uh, yeah, uh, Anika Bukapatnam, are you are you there? Are you ready to read your your poem? Yes, I am. Thank you very much. Okay, okay. Let's see if we could turn it up a little bit. It sounds like your your voice is a little bit faint, but um, let's see. Okay, if we're ready when you are. Okay, sounds good, thank you. Um, I'm presenting, I'm gonna be reading for you two poems today. Um, the first one, it's addressing Asian American hate, which is increasingly prominent today. And it's actually inspired by a billboard I saw the other day that was pretty questionable. Um, it's called, love us like you love our food, hashtag stop Asian hate. Not surprised that once again, we're culinary items to you, abuse, can you hear me now? Yeah, a, a little bit, a little bit better. I think okay. if you could even go closer to the mic or, or yeah. the uh, the camera. Uh, can you hear yeah, me? Yeah, I can. I can hear loud and clear. Okay, okay good. Good. Thank good. You. Not surprised that once again we're culinary items to you. Abuse us, you shoot us, and leave us in pieces. Justice is what you pursue. We're not creamy or chocolate or exotic in flavor, and our existence is not. To your favor we're people just people and assure you we don't need a savior once again thought of as food that's yummy what about when respect doesn't sit right in your tummy will you break us kill us throw us out like food why do we leave a sour taste so rude i don't say you're as white as a baguette don't classify you from what i get so is it too much too awful to ask that our protection isn't a task Normal should not be getting run down or gunned down. Normal should not be getting let down with a frown. It shouldn't be racism or he had a bad day, but we're so loud when we hate it that way. Our lives and strives are no mean of harm, yet faces not white cause you alarm. You hate us, berate us, expect us aloof, and then reduce us to food. There's proof and evidence and recordings of how we are treated. Is it so much to not be beaded? No, you aren't helping our cause by calling us out by our most prominent draws. Treat us like humans, like the humans we are, and then only then we can go far. Oh, that was great. Thank you. That was really good. Yeah, Randy, I have a question or two. Sure. Uh, first question, uh, were you, uh, did you get an opportunity to read that poem at the high school? No. Either uh, Zoom wise or live at the high school? No. Not yet. Not okay, yet. Because <laughs> Thank you. I would, I would strongly suggest that you uh, keep that in the ready for when kids get back to school. Yes, of course. Thank you because uh, it has great meaning for what's going on now. And, you know, the, uh, I, I have to I get into this. I was going to get into this before. You know that the poets in the English language started out uh, actually in the Celtic language. Um, and uh, the Anglo-Saxons were involved in it too, but uh, the Druids had what were called bards. And there were three types of bards. And they were responsible uh, for 
the history conditions as they were in the present and then future casting. So there was a bard for the history. There was a bard for present, what was going on. And there was a bard for the future. And that poem that you read entitles you to be the bard of South Brunswick for the present. Thank you so much. Okay, so now you have a title. <laughs> bard of the present. I liked it because um, it was serious and it had a serious message, but it was also playful. So it, it yeah. made it, uh, you know, it made it easier to, it, it just flowed and I, I got the seriousness of it, but I also liked the, you know, the, the, the playfulness of it too. So yeah, right. I liked it. I appreciate it. Randy, do you know why it was that way? Why you got that feeling? Because of the words she used? I mean, what do you, or, or a certain way that she wrote it? Is that, is that what you're saying? She, she had a close rhyme. Oh, okay. As we saw in a couple of examples that we had throughout history, you know, of the uh, South Brunswick local poets and poems, uh, and that, that close rhyme, you know, like with the lullaby and with yeah. Prenose. And so there's a tradition there, and that, that tradition is... What you're doing is you're, you're uh, luring the reader or the listener into your poem by the rhyme scheme that you use because that makes the uh, listener feel comfortable. And then you hit them with a very important message. And that's why that poem works. And the analogy with food was good too. I thought that was a good way to do it. Thank you. Right. Now, Anika, did you want to, uh, do you mention you might have wanted to read another one? Do you, do you want to do that or? Yeah, um, this is just another poem. And the reason I choose, chose this was two reasons. The first, um, it's about my superstition and I'm an extremely superstitious person. Um, but secondly, it's a reverse poem, meaning that it has a opposite meaning reading it forwards and backwards. Um, hmm. It's called Fateful Conviction. Fate. I refuse to rely on my own potentials, riding strong on the Kesara Sara, throwing caution to the wind, and reeling in destiny. What is but a joke, this constant need to deliberate? My every action is guided by destiny's will. I die if I have the conviction and volition. Taking my life into my own hands would drown me, going with the flow, I'd say. Helpless, better than free, without the helping hand of fortune, I thrive, liberated of decision. And then reverse. Decision, liberated of I thrive, free, without the helping hand of fortune, better than helpless, I'd say, going with the flow would drown me, taking my life into my own hands and volition, I have the conviction, I'd die if my every action is guided by destiny's will. Constant need to deliberate what is but a joke, this destiny, and reeling in caution to the wind, throwing the case sera, sera riding strong on my own potentials, I refuse to rely on fate. <laughs> yeah, that's great. I have to say, I I never heard of these type of poems, the, the reverse poem. And when I got your book and uh, I read one of them and I got to the bottom and it said, read it in reverse, I thought, well, how can that be? And then when I read it, I was really surprised. That I was pleasantly surprised how it, you know, it changed meaning. It's like a, like, like a, not a palindrome exactly, but yeah, I was, I was, um, I never heard of them. And I thought they were pretty inventive. Thank you. So, yeah. Um, yeah, those, those are great. Um, so do you, are you in a writing club? I mean, what do you participate in in school? I mean, right now, uh, I, I guess you have to do everything remotely, but is, are, are there clubs that you belong to at the high school, the, the, the poetry clubs? Um, no, actually, I am focused. I don't go to the South Brunswick High School. Instead, okay. I go to a Middlesex account, County um, School Specialized in health equity and that's where my primary passion lies. Um, I do a lot of work in the menstrual equity space. 
um, speaking about periods and how we shouldn't be ashamed of them. Um, uh -huh. And this is a real outlet for a more like poetic and subtle way to express those same ideas. Okay. That's uh, great. That's great. Yeah. So I, I enjoyed the poems that I read. I read through many of them in your book and uh, probably more from uh, the later one, the Queen of Almost. But yeah. So we're going to have these available at the library. Um, we'll have them in the local local author collection. So they'll, they'll be on display once we get them cataloged and, and you know, with the uh, book jackets on them. So yeah, so if, if someone wanted to check those books out, you could, you can get them soon because we'll have them, we'll have them here in the library. So it'll be part of the collection. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, Randy, that's, uh, that's, that's good to hear uh, uh, that you're going to have this uh, local writers uh, section in the library. Um, another thing I would suggest uh, as the reader of the last two poems and other people in the community, uh, I'm surprised that uh, at official gatherings and so forth um, that a poet is not invited uh, to uh, recite a poem uh, to honor the, uh, the thing that's, uh, that the event is being held for. Um, and now I, I don't know, maybe the leaders in the town think that's an old fashioned way to do things, but back in the old days, this was a big deal. And, uh, I'll never forget when Robert Frost, uh, read a poem at, uh, the Kennedy inauguration and the wind was blowing and the hair was blowing and Robert Frost was old as, uh, uh, Methuselah. Uh, but he labored through it and uh, sounded really good. And um, just as they've had the uh, the uh, the young lady who uh, uh, did the uh, poem for uh, Biden's inauguration, uh, I don't see any reason why at the local level that can't go on. Because I know that uh, many uh, students in South Brunswick are very talented and this would be one way to uh, show off some of that talent. Yeah, yeah, like a, an official, like for a, like a dedication or something like that you're saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, if you, if you have a local historical event, uh, there's no reason why somebody uh, who's commemorated it in some sort of way writing wise can't uh, share that with the public. Um, and, you know, we, uh, I, re I remember that when we had the newspaper, you know, the Central Post and all that, they had a, 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 a poetry section in there, The Sound and the Fury. I used to donate poems to that. And that was really great. Uh, it's a way that you could share with the, the public, local-wise. And uh, we don't have The Sound and the Fury anymore. We don't have the Central Post anymore. And with the COVID thing, uh, isolation seems to be the order of the day. So we have to turn that around. And as people come back together, uh, we have to have uh, 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 avenues for creative people to express themselves and for the public to react to those expressions. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Okie doke. Now, has anybody uh, uh, figured out the haiku? The silence is deafening. <laughs> <laughs> well, what we're, <laughs> what we're going to do, if nobody has figured it out, uh, we're going to leave it this way. Uh, the prize will be waiting for you in the library. <laughs> and remember, there are three, actually three prizes. The one that you can touch and take home with you is just one. The other two, a little more cerebral than that. Yeah, but the thing is, you have to bring in the haiku. You have all the words, but you have to on scramble them.
so that they make sense. And you bring that into Randy in the library, and he will reward you if you are correct. And Randy, I'll have a copy of the prize uh, for you uh, next time I get into the library. Okay. I'll take a crack okay. at it. Okay. And you, you are also in it too. I mean, you could try too uh, because okay. you qualify. But, but somebody, has, somebody has an idea of what it might be. I'll oh, take you a have crack. somebody there with an idea? Yeah, I'll take a crack at it. Okay, go ahead. All right. Snow drapes the Dean graves, speechless under a pearl moon, busy raising ghosts. Excellent. We have a winner. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Who's the genius? What is your name? Uh, Brian Duncan. Okay, Brian. Excellent. Thank good you. Scottish name. Very good. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that the... means you're the bard of the future. Oh, boy. <laughs> Did you know that? Celtic and all that is fantastic. It's all working out, Randy, just the way I thought it was going to work out. <laughs> all coming together, huh? <laughs> Brian, Brian isn't a shill, is, is he? You didn't hire him for this. <laughs> no, I, I, I've never met him before. <laughs> okay, well, Brian is the uh, sole winner... <laughs> of a copy of my chapbook, West of Sand Hill. Wow, that's great. Thank you. Okay, and you need to go to the library. You gotta give me time to get it to the library, a <laughs> copy of it, and I'll give it to Randy, and then you just ask for Randy and he'll give it to you. Fantastic. Okay, now, there's two other things. Remember I said that you're the bard of the future, so you now have a title. You are the South Brunswick Bard of the Future. Uh, that is a title which will go along with your name for the next chapbook that I have of, uh, uh, of, of South Brunswick poems. Fantastic. And this haiku will have your name as the author of it at the beginning <laughs> of that chapbook. Aberration. Okay, wow. so this is your lucky day. I guess so. <laughs> and it's all because of that moon, that special moon we had over the last couple of days. Right, the pearl moon. Luck is with you, and also lunacy, uh, which is, uh, <laughs> has the same root word as, as the moon, Luna. <laughs> Fantastic, thank you. Okay, thanks for participating. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Randy, that worked out perfectly. We couldn't have had it better. Yeah, it worked out. Um, so yeah, that's it. I guess we're 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 good now, right? That's that's the end of the show. <laughs> right. Well, just as I, Brian isn't from uh, Princeton, is he? I I just retired from Princeton. Work, but you live in Kentucky. Oh, teaching I, I, there? I, no, I I managed uh, one of the uh, virology labs at Princeton. Okay, but you don't live in Princeton. No, I live in Kendall Park. Okay, good, because uh, we disqualify anybody from Princeton <laughs> uh, because, you know, they think they're one up on us in South Brunswick, and uh, oh, yeah. we're, ju we're just trying to, uh, uh, you know, level the playing field. Got it. <laughs> okay, good. Well, it's it's a, a breath of fresh air that you're from Kendall Park. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's yeah. amazing the number of creative people that live in Kendall Park. It is amazing. And well, that's my why and, my wife and I used to go to the Hank Callett's uh, poetry things at the library many, many times. Yeah, yeah we miss those. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I think they'll make a comeback. Um, Great. Maybe we can get Hank uh, to, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, restore it. Uh, but I think uh, Randy and I will be working on that. That's a possibility. You know, when we get rid of the masks, because it's hard to read the poems with masks on, uh, <laughs> right. so we got to get rid of that. <laughs> and right. then uh, maybe in the future. And Randy, uh, what's the schedule on that cultural and arts uh, uh, edition on the library? Oh, yeah, it's um, it could start construction probably will start sometime next year. 
So what okay. it is, if everybody doesn't know, there'll actually be like an, an auditorium. There'll be a, a, a 300 seat um, auditorium. So that would be you know, a great stage for things like that. So we'll have our yeah. own small theater. Yeah, yeah, uh, a 300 seat, that's good. <laughs> that's gonna be hard to fill for a poetry recital, but uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, with young people involved and so forth, I think we can pull it off. Yeah. Okay, Randy, that's it. Uh, that's all I have. Well, I'd like to thank everyone for coming out and, um, and Anika, thank you for coming out and reading your poetry. And Ed, thanks for, for putting everything into that. And um, so we'll have another program next month to be announced. And I don't know what it'll be, but we'll, we'll have something about South Brunswick history. So um, uh, yeah, yeah, we may want to do that farmers thing in uh, May. Uh, yeah, yeah, we could, we could work on that. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, That's I mean, I, that, that'll really get people excited. <laughs> <laughs> It's Roy Tommy we we can have a field trip and watch things grow. How about that? <laughs> okay. You want to All right. Well, good night, everybody. And uh, we'll good either night. see you around the library or see you next month here. Okay. Thanks. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you. All right. Good night. Oh, there he is. Yeah. I'm going to see Rain.